Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I am thrilled to have Paul Greenberg here. Um, his book, Four Fish, um, was a New York Times bestseller. And, and he just this year, uh, at the James Beards uh, Awards, won the prize for best writing in literature. Um, it's, a, it's a terrific read, and it's about a subject very dear to um, the food team's uh, passion. Um, as you know, we, we care deeply about sustainability. And if, if you, some of you have read the TechCrunch uh, um, article of most recently, you know, the, 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 it's becoming really clear that the food is the new frontier in sustainability. Uh, the way we raise cattle, the, ways, the way we raise high volume uh, corn and soy, um, just dumps all sorts of methane and, and um, CO2 into the air. Uh, it, we need to change the way we do that. Paul is here to kick off a series of, of um, speeches on sustainable and sustainability in seafood. As you know, we kicked off the Google Green Seafood Program last year. And this year, uh, we have done the CSF, Community Supported Fishery, uh, with local fishermen, the, f the first CSF in Northern California. By doing so, we're, we're supporting sustainable fisheries in a way that Paul will explain uh, uh, wonderfully to us. He, he's a great storyteller and, and very passionate about this subject. So I'm just very honored to have him. Hi. Um, thanks, Liv, very much. Um, really great to be here. Um, before I get going, I always kind of like to get a sense of who, who I'm talking to and sort of what your relationship is to the ocean. So a show of hands, who here uh, considers himself a fisherman of any kind, sport fisherman or commercial? All right, two, good. Um, who carries with them um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium's uh, sort of sustainable uh, seafood card? Very good. I'd say a, a quarter. Liv, I think you can do better. <laughs> um, and um, who here only eats wild fish and categorically refuses to eat farmed fish? OK, good. All right, that's good. Good to get started. So um, when I get approached about this book, uh, a lot of people come to me and they say, you know, why four fish? Um, and there's an honest answer and there's a dishonest a answer. You know, the dishonest answer is that of looking across the food system, I realized that this was you know, a very intelligent way to approach the subject. But the, the real answer is actually it was um, all because of an anxiety attack. Um, and I'm sure here at Google you actually have your shares of anxiety attacks when confronted with large projects that you have to complete. But um, basically what happened, I write for the New York Times quite a bit, and um, I've been writing articles about the, the ocean. I'm a big fisherman myself, and so it was always an area of concern for me. And um, at a certain point, we started to get a little bit of momentum, and people were interested in the ocean, more than just article interested, actually book interested. And having previously um, written only a, a small literary novel that I think sold four dozen copies, um, I, I suddenly was exposed to a, a, a market, and people wanted this, to hear more about this topic. So what happened is uh, my agent said, let's, let's go out and sell a book. So we put a proposal together. And the proposal was called The Fish on Your Plate. Um, and unexpectedly, not just one, not just two, but three or four different publishers wanted it. And so there was a little bit of a bidding war. It's you know, everybody's, you know, every writer's dream fantasy. You know, people wanted my book. Uh, but you know, and we had the bidding war, blah, blah, blah. And finally, we settled on a final price. And it was great. And I signed the contract. And then the next day, I woke up. And I realized, oh my god, I'm going to have to write this book. Um, and I was suddenly like, oh. What am I going to do? And what am I going to have to write? I'm going to have to write a book called The Fish on Your Plate. And so I try to figure out, well, how can I kind of dispatch with this anxiety? How can I kind of get through it? And as I think you all know, when faced with a huge deadline, really the best way to get through anxiety is just to, is just to start working and start kind of plugging away. So I started looking around for possible sources that could lead me in a, you know, a, a fruitful, un-anxiety uh, direction. Um, but unfortunately, the first piece of literature I came across was sort of a kind of an ocean almanac that listed out sort of random statistics about the ocean. And this only served to kind of further cause me anxiety. Um, the first thing I came across was um, something about the fish that we eat. And it turns out that most of the fish that we eat come from a single taxonomic order, 
those of you who, everybody remember the taxonomic uh, order, kingdom phylum, da da da. So order is about three or four rungs down. And um, turns out we all, generally we tend to eat from the order Persiformes, um, tuna, flounder, all the things called sea bass. Um, they're all from the order Persiformes. And I came across this really devastating statistic, which was that the order Persiformes is the most species rich uh, order of vertebrates on Earth, over 7,000 species in the order Persiformes. And I was like, great, I'm going to have to write a book called 7,000 Fish, um, which I think if I had written, I would not be here today and none of you would be here today. Um, so I figured I would really need to kind of you know, try and simplify things. Um, so I started looking around at kind of different models out there of simplification, for lack of a better word. Um, and inevitably, I was sort of led to that ultimate you know, archetype in food politics um, to Michael Pollan. Anybody here read Michael Pollan, Omnivore's Dilemma, or Botany of Desire? List them high. OK, I, about half the room. Um, so yeah, so um, Michael, very, very influential for me. And um, uh, you know, in his book, Omnivore's Dilemma, he dissects the you know, food system by looking at four meals in Botany of Desire. He dissects the sort of human relationship with plants by looking at four plants. So I thought, well, you know, work for Michael. Uh, maybe it'll work for me. Um, but at the same time, you know, I didn't want to be totally cheese ball and uh, didn't want to have total like plagiarism because you know there's a fine line between homage and plagiarism. Um, so I started to think, well, you know, is there some honest justification to all of this? Um, so oh, before I forget, I, it's on my mind. I did set up a Twitter hashtag for this talk. So it's hashtag, it's four fish Google. So if I see any of you typing or texting, I know that you're just contributing to the Twitter feed. Um, anyway, um, so, so Michael was my model in this and I thought, okay, so then I started to think, OK, well, does four make sense? Is there, what about four makes sense in my context that I'm trying to do? And then I came across something that was actually genuinely anxiety reducing because it had a real idea in it. Um, I came across a book called uh, A History of Domesticated Mammals um, by an Oxford professor. And I came across this great phrase. And, and, and the, this professor, she said, um, uh, if you look at the middens of Neolithic humans, you know, going back 10,000 years ago when we were primarily hunter-gatherers and not farmers, um, you will find literally dozens of mammals in the fire pits um, of Neolithic humans. Um, lynx, muskrat, goats of all kinds, different hoofed mammals, predator, herbivore, didn't matter. If, if, it, if it moved and had meat on it, we generally ate it. Um, but then you, know, you go forward to the time of Christ and you look in the fire pits and what do you find? Well, with some exceptions, you generally find four, you know, uh, cattle, pigs, sheep, goats. So OK, that, that seemed like I was going somewhere. And then I thought, well, does this apply elsewhere in the sort of human-animal relationship? Um, and it so happened that I had a, uh, uh, an interview scheduled for a Times article I was writing uh, with an author named Mark Kurlansky. Anybody ever read anything by Mark Kurlansky? Author of the great book Cod and Salt. Um, and also, well, Mark, so Mark wrote this book called Cod, which was also very influential for me, um, kind of about um, telling the whole story of fisheries decline through this single fish, the codfish. Um, but at the time, Mark was working on a book uh, called The Big Oyster. Um, and it was talking about the oyster culture of New York City. Um, something, anybody here from the East Coast? Any East Coasters here, New Yorkers? Well, here's something for you New Yorkers and everyone, which kind of blew my mind. Um, up until about 1890, the average per capita consumption of local New York Harbor oysters, of your average New Yorker, ate six to 700 New York Harbor oysters a year. That fishery is gone. Um, but anyway, at the time, um, Mark was working on this article, I mean, working on this book, and he had all these menus um, from all these old restaurants from the 1890s. And he said, look at these menus. Look at the birds these people used to eat. Snipe, woodcock, grouse, pheasant, four kinds of water ducks, grebes, everything. They ate everything. Again, you get to the age of modern animal husbandry, we're down to four. Turkeys, ducks, chickens, geese. Yes, I know, I see some chefs in the audience. You've eaten a pigeon, I know. But when you're talking about large scale animal husbandry, we're really talking about this human desire to simplify things. So the anxiety started to abate. I realized I was sort of maybe on to something. Um, and then another thing kind of came across my path. Um, if you guys, you know, if any of you out there is sort of fish curious, um, and I know, I imagine you guys must have an interest in data. Um, the uh, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization produces a uh, report every few years uh, called the State of, um, uh, of World Fisheries and Aquaculture. 
you know, sort of a voluminous overview. It's like a database of databases of all the world's fishery, fishing countries and aquaculture countries sort of cobbled together. And in the preface, and you should know that journalists, when approached with a scientific paper, will generally only read the preface. Um, but in the preface of that particular report um, was this sort of striking, you know, slap you in the face statistic, which was that uh, in the next 10 years, uh, for the first time in human history, uh, farm seafood will overtake wild seafood in the marketplace for the first time in history. So I thought, well, you know, that's, that's huge. I mean, that's something we really have not experienced since we came out of the caves. I mean, this is an epical thing, and it's happening right here, right now. It's very weird, you know, when you pass through a historical moment, because it never feels like a historical moment. I remember I was in the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union collapsed. And everyone asked, what was it like? What was it like? Well, I, you know, I had eggs for breakfast. And, but you know, later on, wow, it's a historical moment. So you know, in case you're sort of wondering, will I ever live through a historical moment? You are living through one of the biggest historical moments ever. I, I, was, I was struck when, did anyone notice? Who here reads the New York Times online um, with any degree? Oh, boy, you guys really are the West Coast. Um, anyway, you know, the New York Times has a most emailed list. And the day that Osama bin Laden was killed, for two days running, the most emailed story, tilapia. So you know you can see where you know this is of historical importance. It's bigger than Osama. Um, so anyway, so that really struck me. Half of the world seafood farmed. Uh, 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 a tendency of humans to take the wild world and purify it and simplify it. Um, and then there was a sort of other thing that was just purely repertorial that I came across. Um, I'm, as I say, I'm a big fisherman. Uh, I fished a lot when I was a kid. Um, but as anyone who's really into fishing can attest, your desire to fish is sort of inadvertently, or sorry, inversely proportional to your desire to have sex. So when up until about 14 or 15, you're really into fishing, and then it starts to plummet, and then your desire to you know, pursue uh, that kind of other vector starts to rise. But then as you reach your mid-30s, you know, the, the sexual desire starts to wet, you know, wane a little bit. And that, and lo and behold, fishing is back. Um, and so I found, after taking a long hiatus, uh, a large part of that uh, working in East Europe, um, I came back and I started fishing again. And what I found is that the fish that I was encountering, both in the sea and in the market, were very different. Um, does anybody here like to just kind of go to a fish market and sort of look what's on ice, right? It's, it's interesting. It's much more interesting, I find, uh, than just going to like a butcher shop because you know you're looking at all of these different species, all of these different varieties. It's really really interesting. Um, but what I found uh, was that the fish market uh, of you know 2004, 2005, when I was starting to research this book, uh, was very different. And what I started to notice was this predominance of I would what I would call f um, flesh archetypes. Um, if you ever go into a seafood restaurant or you go looking for seafood to buy for your house, if you're a, you know, of a sort of West European consciousness, not necessarily origin, um, you gravitate towards these four flesh archetypes. We always seem to want to have you know, something that's pink and succulent, you know, something that has a high oil content that we could smoke or bake, and that would be your salmon. right? Humans always want to seem to have something that's white and flaky, a white and flaky fish that you could deep fry or put on a sandwich, right, or in a fish stick. And that is a, a flesh archetype that typically, um, you know, throughout the last uh, 100 years or so, was, that part was played by cod. But um, as I'll talk about later, other fish are coming in to play that role. Um, we always seem to want to have um, something that's a little bit more substantial, a, a white fleshed fish that we could broil. Um, either whole or in fillet form, and that would be a fish that would normally in the market be called um, sea bass or sometimes snapper. And, and you know, for you chefs out there who are wondering, well, what's a sea bass? What's a snapper? It's funny when I, a few years back, I was working on a story about Chilean sea bass for the New York Times, and um, a bunch of people were, you know, had heard the whole Chilean sea bass story. As I'm sure anybody here, sort of hear the Chilean sea bass story, right? So, so they were like, oh yeah, I know that Chilean sea bass story. Well, that's that story where they started selling that, they started replacing the real sea bass with the Chilean sea bass. And I was like, you know, you're, you're right, kind of. But then I would say, but what's the real sea bass? Silence. The fact is there is no real sea bass. Um, there, there are eight taxonomic families with fish in them called sea bass, just as there are many taxonomic families in them called, with fish called um, snapper. And in fact, like the Chilean sea bass, in, in Spanish, when it was first discovered off Chile, it was used not to fill the sea bass role. It was used to fill the um, codfish role. 
And um, it was initially known in Spanish as Bacalao de Profundidad, the cod of the deep. So that was, you know, you can see there's a little bit of overlap and slippage as occurs. Um, finally, the fourth archetype that everyone seemed to want to have on their plate or in their restaurant menu uh, was a big red hunk of beef-like stuff you could throw on the grill or sushi up. Um, and this is something that was completely absent in the fish market of my youth, but which is a predominant red stripe going down the market, the center of every fish market I see today, and that it would, of course, be your tuna. So there I had it. You know, I had my half wild, half domesticated, uh, these four flesh archetypes um, that were starting to dominate seafood markets everywhere. And it figured, you know, if, you, if any of you are ever sort of debating to write a um, nonfiction book, it's kind of an important moment. You know, having a central pivot point that you can kind of dance, it's sort of like, I, once, I remember I once biked across the island of Crete in Greece, and, and going down the center of Crete is a mountain range, and the road goes like this, and you go back and forth across the ridge. That's to me what writing a nonfiction book is like. It's like, it's always, most of the time it's uphill, and you're always going off over, back and forth across this same ridge, redefining your perspective, seeing what the journey is like, and trying to come to some sort of conclusion. So that's what I did. And I set out across the world, um, to many, many countries throughout the world, uh, looking at these four flesh archetypes in their farmed and their wild form. So um, being a person who desired uh, to sell books, I decided to start uh, with that archetype that is sort of the most commonly on people's minds these days, uh, which is salmon. Um, for those of you who are from the East Coast, and also from people on the West Coast here, uh, I think the thing that dominates um, salmon more than anything else, the intellectual concept, um, is the loss of memory of wild salmon. Um, there's, a, there's a marine ecologist named Daniel Pauly who has a really interesting theory. It's called the shifting baselines theory. And the idea of shifting baselines is that each generation has a successively diminished view of what he or she thinks is abundant in the wild. So the example of salmon. I'm from New England, um, and uh, nobody I talk to when I go back east knows that once upon a time we had wild salmon in New England. The Connecticut River, my home river, had a run of anywhere from 40,000 to 100,000 wild Atlantic salmon each and every year came up the river. And that was one of the poorer rivers in New England. There were salmon rivers that extended on up past Connecticut into Rhode Island, Massachusetts, up through Maine and into Atlantic Canada. What happened with those rivers is that River by river, uh, they got knocked out by small-scale dams, just as you guys have experienced the sort of mega hydropower developments that have really uh, laid havoc to the salmon here. Our death of salmon was really a death by many cuts. Um, and initially, the colonists, when they came to the United States or came to, to, to the Americas, um, they built small-scale dams, not the big hydropower dams that you guys have out here, but small-scale dams, sometimes to power mills, sometimes actually for ice ponds. Um, you know, there was no freezer or refrigeration, so if you dammed a little river, you could back up the water and it would freeze in the wintertime. You could harvest the ice and sell it in an ice house during the summertime. Um, each of these little dams cut off a little piece of the salmon nation. Um, you know, salmon are genetically specific to every little tributary. Every time you're walking around a river now, if you ever see a little rivulet in salmon country, you can say that little rivulet represents a specific genetic slice of the salmon pie. Um, and what was happening throughout the 17th and 18th century in New England was that the pie was getting sliced off piece by piece by piece by piece. And then finally, in 1798, the big dams come. Um, and they put a dam across the main stem of the Connecticut River. And for about three years, salmon come back to that dam, and they bang up against it, turn around, bang up against it, turn around. And then finally, after three or four years, they gave up, and they just died at sea. And that was the end of them. And so you know, a salmon run that had existed for thousands and thousands and thousands of years just ended. Um, parallel to that, though, uh, or I should say successfully after that, um, with fisheries, there's always something of what I call one-two punch. Um, fishermen always like to blame environmental causes for the decline of fish. Um, but environmentalists often point their finger at fishermen. But in, in my overview of the situation, it's generally a one-two punch. And salmon is exemplary of that. So as I say, we were losing salmon tributary by tributary throughout colonial New, Eng New England, also losing them in Europe. Because you know, actually, all of salmon kind originates from a single river system in Azurias, Spain. Um, and uh, what happens, those fish radiated out when the continents were closer together. They radiated out to either side so that now, uh, Atlantic salmon from both continents all migrate to a single point uh, off of Greenland to feed. 
What happened is post-World War II, and, and actually World War II actually turns out to be a kind of key thing as far as the present fisheries crisis that we're in. Um, because you know people were out of food, agriculture was in ruins, people were looking for new grounds to exploit. Um, you know all these things had been perfected under World War II: um, sonar, lightweight polymers that you can use for netting, and all and long lines and so forth. So what happened in the late 40s, early 50s, is that a small group of uh, fishermen from the Faroe Islands found that little point off of Greenland where every single freaking Atlantic salmon in the world went to feed. And they fished it, and they fished it extremely hard. And what you see is a collapse of salmon across range. Whenever you fish an aggregated stock that comes from many different places, and you fish them all at once, you can do much more damage than if you fish a specific stock. Like if those salmon had been fished at the mouth of, say, the Penobscot River, they would have only el eliminated the Penobscot. But because they fished this aggregated stock, they laid waste to salmon around the Atlantic. Um, and so what you have is a progressive decline um, that goes into very steep decline to the point where, you know, and this a lot of people don't realize this, but Atlantic salmon are commercially extinct. So what does that mean, commercial extinction? It means they're not extinct. There are probably in the world, I've heard estimates anywhere that range from half a million to a million and a half wild Atlantic salmon left in the world. Uh, but it's not worth it to go fishing for them. You spend more calories searching for those fish than you will get in the calories or the dollar calories um, from bringing them to market. Um, what's interesting, though, along the same pathway, if you sort of chart on a graph the decline of wild Atlantic salmon on one side, you see on the other side another vector going up. And what is that? Farm salmon. Um, and farm salmon actually goes back a long way, um, not as an industrial product, but as a, a, an intellectual concept that can be executed. Um, the, uh, the first farm salmon that were actually, can, can somebody kill that microphone over there? I don't know. Um, the first farm salmon that were um, first uh, attempted were actually goes back to France in the 1400s. Um, and, and salmon turns out to be actually one of the most cultivatable fish. Um, and the reason actually goes back to the egg. Anybody here ever eat a salmon caviar? or um, you know, salmon roe or use it for bait, right? It's a biggish egg. I mean, it's, it's compared to a, a chicken egg, it's tiny, but it's about that big, bright orange, very oily, right? Like if you dropped a salmon egg in, in, in water, a little pool of oil would form around it. And it turns out that that, that egg is, is critical to aquaculture because it's very, very nutrient rich. And when the fish hatches out of that egg, it um, carries that yolk sac around with it for quite a long time. And it can live off of that yolk sac until it's ready to transition onto larger feed. What that means is that in aquaculture, um, you can transition from uh, a, a little tiny fish to a fish that can actually start e eating industrial feed pretty early on. So that's one key thing. The other thing that makes salmon, um, what made salmon a, a, a sort of an ideal uh, ca uh, potential for aquaculture was, was genetics. Um, you know, all the f animals that we eat, you know, I don't care whether they're heritage pigs or, you know, I don't, you know, whatever kind of fancy name you attach to all this, you know, local grass-fed blah 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 cow. They're all the product of 10,000 years of selective breeding. You know, selective breeding at first was very haphazard. You know, that horse runs fast, that horse runs fast, let's put them together, maybe we'll get a fast horse. Um, but it got progressively more sophisticated as the years went by, to the point where by the time 1940s and 50s roll around, um, theories of population genetics are actually being put into practice. And farmers are actually able to select um, and move entire populations of animals to become more efficient than they ever were, um, creating, in fact, sort of sub-races of animals. And what happened with fish is that there was a guy, you know, with all developments in technology, you guys know this, that, you know, a lot of people like to tr kind of lay claim to an invention, but, you know, in the kind of hive-like mind that is appearing out of humanity, you know, there are not very many da Vinci's left anymore, and that, you know, inventions seem to kind of bubble up from many, many sources. So many people were working on the salmon thing uh, at the same time. The Norwegians, um, the Scottish, the Canadians, the Americans, not too far from here in Puget Sound. But the one I focused on was a Norwegian guy named uh, Trygva Gedrum. And um, Trygva, uh, at the time, wanted to be a sheep breeder. That's all he wanted to do in life. Um, but he got a full right to come to the United States. And he met a guy named Jay Lawrence Lush, who's considered the father of modern animal breeding. And uh, he started you know, kind of hearing his theories about moving populations to becoming more efficient, you know, because ultimately what a farmer is always looking for is faster growth, less feed to produce more pounds of finished product. Um, 
he studied with Lesh for a while. He got back to Norway, and he found that there were these two brothers in the fjord of Hitra who were starting to, do, uh, grow, starting to grow salmon in net cages suspended in the fjord. And he realized, oh my god, there is a tremendous potential for you know, improvement with these salmon. Because unlike, say, cattle and pigs and goats and sheep, which had, had many, many probably useful genes bred out of them over 10,000 years, salmon still were pretty diverse, and there were a lot of genes out there. And so what Gedrem did at this uh, place called Akvaforsk, um, he started a breeding program where he gathered up salmon from 40 different river systems around Norway. And some rivers were long, some rivers were short, some rivers had a lot of rapids, some rivers were still. So you can imagine, every salmon was a little different. And amidst all that multiplicity of genes, he realized there was a great potential for improvement. The other thing that makes you capable of improving a salmon quickly is that unlike cattle and pigs and sheep that have maybe one or two offspring a season, salmon every time they lay their eggs are going to produce several thousand eggs. So you have this potential, once you've found a good cross, you have the potential to duplicate that cross many, 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 many times. Um, and so pretty soon, once Gedrim had started to apply these theories, and again, this was going on in Scotland and Canada as well, they were able to double the growth rate of Atlantic salmon in 10 years, something that it had taken us about 10,000 years with land animals. So environmentalists argue that what in fact was created out of these experiments was a subrace of salmon. Um, the Latin name for, for Atlantic salmon is Salmo salar. Uh, but you know, environmentalists who took issue with this movement um, refer to these fish as Salmo domesticus a completely domesticated race of salmon. Now what happens when you start making a fish that's more and more efficient, that needs less feed, because keep in mind the original salmon required, as, farm salmon required as much as six pounds of wild fish to grow a single pound of farmed fish. But once they started getting more efficient, they started getting cheaper. But once they start getting cheaper, other people get into the game. And once people get into the game and the, 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 the secret is out, everybody's trying salmon farming. And before you know it, people have to grow much, much more salmon to break even. And so you start to see the fjords of Norway, uh, the Bay of Fundy in Canada, Puget Sound, start to fill up with these farmed salmon. The more densely you farm salmon, the more nutrients get released into the water. You get algae blooms, uh, dead zones, deoxygenation, and you also get the spread of pathogens. Uh, like infectious salmon anemia, uh, and an ectoparasite um, called a sea louse, which is this nasty little creature that burrows under your skin if you're a salmon um, and sucks your. <laughs> I've been so far, I don't have sea lice, so you can shake my hand afterward. Um, but um, it is, um, you know, it, it, it's a problem, and it, and it becomes what I call the delete and replace model of aquaculture. So, you know, originally it was conceived of to kind of make up for a decline in wild fish. But probably in the end, it caused an exacerbation of it. Um, because when you start plunking down salmon farms right in the migration routes of already depressed populations, and I don't know, I don't mean emotionally depressed, but population depressed, um, you start to see you know, a negative effect. Where we are now um, is kind of a funny point, because um, I think environmentalists have, have, have staged pretty successful campaigns against farm salmon. And it's probably not expanding at the rate it used to. But it's still expanding. Um, but there's a kind of 2.0 thing going on. Is it, by the way, is it really backwards to say something, something 2.0? Like now that we're in sort of, what are we? Are we in internet 2.0 or 3.0 at this point? Anyone know? I don't know. I'm, all right. Well, anyway, so the 2.0 of salmon farming is where we are today. And, and I should say the pairing of salmon farming and salmon extirpation, um, which is that now we're really looking at the potential cataclysm of salmon in the Pacific. Um, Atlantic salmon, it's only a single species. It's the only species of salmon that we have in the Atlantic Ocean. Here in the Pacific, you have five species, pink, chum, uh, coho, king, sockeye, right? Um, we've been losing those salmon just like we lost them in, in the Atlantic. We've been losing them you know, south to north, a wave of extirpation. And in fact, you know, fortunately, you guys have a salmon season this year. But I think, what was it, lived for the last two years? Uh, three years, you have not had salmon here in California. And I actually counted salmon in Oregon when I took a year off from college. Um, and my, it was a very easy job because I actually didn't count any uh, salmon during my time in Oregon. I counted one salmon. Um, and that's been spreading from south to north, moving progressively further and further north, to the point where the, really the last stronghold, the last bastion of the salmon nation on this continent anyway, is Alaska. And the epicenter of that salmon nation is a place called Bristol Bay. Um, has anybody here ever heard of um, the Pebble Mine Project? Raise your hand if you have. 
So this is shocking. Um, I don't know if any of you consider yourselves an environmentalist of any kind, but this is the biggest environmental issue I think we're going to face in the next 15 to 20 years. Uh, Bristol Bay is the site of the largest sockeye salmon run left in the world. You know, I was just up in Seattle, and they were talking about, oh, you know, we have a pretty good run of salmon in the Skagit River. Um, I think we have 40,000 fish. Bristol Bay, 40 million fish a year. And that's just the sockeye. If you add in the king, the coho, the chum, and the pink, you've got 60 million fish coming into that fishery. If you've ever had a can of salmon, right, that's probably coming from Bristol Bay. This is like the, this is like the Iowa, you know, Corn is to Iowa as salmon is to Bristol Bay. Well, as human ingenuity would have it, uh, a large British consortium called Anglo-American has discovered a copper deposit underneath the spawning grounds in Bristol Bay. And I should say, you know, what a salmon like to spawn in? They like to spawn in gravel, right? And what Bristol Bay is is basically a huge gravel pile, 200 feet deep. But underneath all that gravel is copper and gold and molybdenum, I think. Uh, uh, an element I never heard of until I got involved in this whole thing. So um, it's a very diffuse copper deposit. In fact, if you were to look at it by, um, not by um, what you were looking for, but what's the actual composition of the mine, it, you, it would be a sulfur mine. Um, but it's worth $300 billion. And the plan is to build the largest earthen dam in North America, taller than the Space Needle, in a seismic area, um, to sift through all of this slag and create enough slag that would bury the city of Washington, D.C. In, in 150 feet, um, and then basically turn it into a copper mine. Now, if you're a salmon, copper is not your friend. Um, a concentration of two parts per billion of copper in the water is enough to throw off a salmon's sense of smell. And what does a salmon use its sense of smell for? Mostly migration. So if you, you know, have two, you know, two, copper in the water, 60 million salmon trying to get to the Bering Sea and back, you're basically going to have a lot of lost salmon swimming around. And it sounds funny, except the fact that if they get lost, they don't spawn, and that's that. So parallel to this is the sort of other genius project of the human species, which is the genetically modified salmon. Who, anybody here hear of the genetically modified salmon that's sort of being proposed? Right. So this fish, um, it's the ultimate sort of synthesis of of everything we screw up in the ocean. But it's an Atlantic salmon, uh, already the selectively bred Atlantic salmon that's already growing twice as fast, right? With a Chinook salmon, king salmon growth gene inserted into its genome, uh, sorry, into its DNA. And then a third uh, a promoter inhibitor from an, a fish called an ocean pout, which by the way is not kosher. Um, but the rabbis say this fish is kosher. Anyway, the regular protein is stuck onto the Chinook salmon growth gene, and it's put permanently in the on position. And what you end up with is a salmon that grows twice as fast as the already twice as fast growing um, selectively bred salmon. What does this all mean? Well, if you add it all up, if Pebble Mine goes through and we destroy the biggest run of, copper, of um, sockeye salmon left on Earth, we will lose about 200 million pounds of salmon a year. If the aqua bounty genetically modified salmon goes through FDA, and by the way, it's going through FDA, they're trying to get it through, not through EPA, but they're trying to get it through FDA as a veterinary drug. The, the business plan for this thing is so screwed up. The idea is that they're going to clone the eggs in Prince Edward Island, Canada, fly them to Panama, grow them out in Panama, fillet them, and then send the meat back to here and sell it as salmon. No labeling, except the, the, fortunately the California state legislature, the only legislature that has gone on the record and said there will be mandatory lab labeling of GMO salmon. So thank, congratulations, California. You did a good job on that one. Um, you might be going broke, but at least you're going to keep the genetically modified salmon labeled. Um, but anyway, so if that happens and it does get approved, as a, it's a veterinary drug that helps, that medicates the salmon to grow faster. Very screwed up. Anyway, so the idea, so if that goes through, We'll lose 200 million pounds of salmon in Bristol Bay if we put in Pebble Mine, and we'll gain 200 million pounds of salmon if, if we convert all the salmon farms of North America um, into um, genetically modified salmon. So while I don't think that there's a conspiracy between Aqua Bounty and the GMO salmon and Anglo-American and their Pebble Mine, there's a larger conspiracy of humanity of trying to eliminate randomness, um, predictability, uh, 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 unpredictability, uh, and, and get to a system that just produces, in a very brute force way, more meat for humans. Um, 
And personally, that's not the model I would like to see going forward. The next fish that I, that I looked at um, was not quite as sad a story, but it's still a story all the same, is I looked at um, uh, sea bass, um, particularly at European sea bass. Anybody here ever eat a fish called a branzino, right? Or a ludemer, ludemer or bar, you ever see that one? It's all the same fish. Um, and what's interesting is that you know, while people make these very sort of strong positions about salmon, I will only eat wild salmon, um, they don't seem to really recognize how much farmed fish has started to infiltrate um, the, the market. And in fact, 100% of these fish, whether you call them Branzino, Ludemer, or whatever, um, are actually farmed at this point. Um, and so I looked at that. It, it turns out to be actually a very important development for aquaculture because um, uh, sea bass, um, European sea bass, uh, are what I call like a Rosetta Stone fish. Um, remember I talked about the big egg and the salmon and sort of how it was good, you know, pretty easy for aquaculture? Well, European sea bass and most of the order Persiformes, they hatch out of little eggs, little tiny eggs that I think, as I say in the book, are, are sort of like if you hatch out of one of these little eggs, it's, it's sort of like you have enough nutrition similar to the amount of oxygen you have when your plane is crashing and the mask drops down and you have like you know, four breaths and then you gotta like figure out some other way to continue on. That's the way a sea bass is when it's hatched. Um, and the thing is, to confound things further, fish from the order Persiformes, when they hatch, will only eat live feed. So you have to figure out, well, how am I going to feed these things live microscopic feed? Well, it turns out there was this fortunate um, discovery that um, for years the ch uh, Chinese have been growing carp in carp ponds. But what they found was there was in freshwater this organism called a rotifer that was clogging up their filter. It's a microorganism. And it turns out that if you skim these suckers off and you feed them lipids, um, they look like basically little vibrating raviolis. Um, and it's kind of perfect sea bass food. And once that was sort of figured out, that you could start these little creatures on rotifers, that was the first step. The second step was another creature that people stumbled across, which you've probably stumbled across. Has anybody ever, um, you know, you guys are a little young for this, but I feel like I've asked younger people, uh, anyone ever, you know, want to admit to ordering um, sea monkeys from the back of a comic book? You ever see those, right? If you haven't, you know, it's this thing, when I was a kid, I was, you know, I'm, date myself, 43 years old. So it was this thing, it was called instant life, and you could order these little eggs, and you would put them in water, and they would hatch, and there were all these scenarios. You could buy sea monkey swings, and sea monkey thrones, and there was, you know. Um, but basically what they were, uh, well, they were, they were actually brought into the comic book market by a guy named Otto von Braun, who is a, or uh, something, von, I'm, I'm getting that name wrong, but uh, he was a Jewish neo-Nazi. Um, he also invented the x-ray specs, which you might not remember, but they have like threads and it makes it seem like you're seeing through somebody's body. But, you know, he invented that. He also was promoted divers who dived off of high dives into buckets. Um, and he brought the sea monkey to American youth in the 70s and the 80s. Um, but, but, but it turns out these creatures are actually, they're called artemia. Um, and they hatch out of these little cysts that can last for thousands of years um, and still be viable. So it's perfect aquaculture food. You can just sort of ship it around the world. And what's interesting about the, the artemia is, um, you know, they come from the Great Salt Lake. I remember I was doing a story about cod aquaculture and I was talking to one of the scientists about it and I said, um, uh, so where do you get those artemia from? He's like, oh, well, those come from the Great Salt Lake. And I go, oh, that's so interesting. I didn't know that Norway had a Great Salt Lake. He said, no, 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 you're, you're Great Salt Lake. And so, you know, this Great Salt Lake that I always thought of was this, you know, dead zone turns out to be the aquaculture um, engine for a huge part of the world. So I looked at sea bass mostly to kind of talk about, you know, what happens when we figure stuff out. You know, I mean, I think you guys at Google, you're all about trying to figure out systems, right? Figure out some overarching system that makes sense for humanity. But as you've probably found in your own work, when you figure out something halfway, you can get sent down some pretty half-baked pathways. And the thing is, once you decoded the sea bass, um, it meant that you could pretty much decode every fish in the sea. So now, humanity has the capability to, to aquaculture, to farm any single creature in the sea. But some f creatures work and some creatures don't. And some creatures will work for a population that's going to be 10 billion people, and some most definitely don't. You know, should we be farming bluefin tuna? Well, one of the great advantages of fish versus, say, chicken um, or beef is that fish have a lot, are very energistically efficient. They should be anyway. Um, whereas land animals stand and exert energy uh, standing, you have to stand against gravity, fish float. And all that energy that goes into standing uh, in fish goes into making meat. Um, fish are cold-blooded. In mammals, you have to put all this energy into heating your blood and you know, staying alive like that. 
fish, just put it into meat. Um, but something like the bluefin tuna, which I don't know if you know this, but bluefin, yellowfin, uh, big eye tuna, the main sushi tunas, all warm blooded. They raise their body temperature 20 degrees above ambient. So is that a good fish for aquaculture? Other thing about tuna, swim, at, swim regularly swim at 40 miles an hour. Do you really want to farm a fish that's like has the speed of a Yugo or some you know a low grade automobile and it's going to be bashing into the side of your aquaculture facility all the time? I don't think so. Not a good idea. But yet people are doing it. And this is the kind of you know continued idiocy I think of humanity to sort of see a market and pursue that market at any cost rather than thinking about the big picture of sensibly trying to balance wild and farm product to feed 10 billion people. So the next fish I did after the sea bass um, was um, cod. And you know, whereas the sea bass and the, and the salmon were kind of you know, these specialty fish uh, you know, that became market fish, I mean, that became sort of commodities, codfish was always a commodity. Um, uh, I mentioned Mark Kurlansky earlier. Um, he was telling me when he was a kid growing up, when his mother was serving cod, um, it would, she would just call it fish. He, she, you know, every other fish had a name, you know, haddock, sole, flounder, that all had a name. But cod was just fish. What's for dinner? Fish. Um, and that's, in fact, sort of the way we've treated it. And cod really represents what happens when humanity builds up its, what's called its fishing effort to a point where wild fisheries really can't support what we've done. I mentioned earlier about all the technological innovations that happened post-World War II. What that resulted in was a quintupling of the world catch to the point where we now take out of the ocean something like 90 million tons of fish a year. That's the equivalent to the human weight of China taken out of the sea every year. And you could say on the one hand, you could say, oh my god, what a raping of the ocean. What a horrible thing to do. On the other hand, you could say, wow, the ocean. Yeah, what a productive system. 90 million tons a year that it seems to produce year in and year out. Um, so with codfish, um, you know, I sort of followed it through its different iterations. And, and, and the codfish story is really a story of substitution. Um, if you really want to tell the codfish story, one of the great ways to tell it, and I don't really do this in the book, but I subsequently found it's a good way to tell it, is that um, the, the thing that really you can really follow through history is that pinnacle of American seafood cuisine, um, the filet of fish sandwich. Um, the filet of fish sandwich, I always imagine there was this, you know, I imagine this, uh, this dialogue between the guy who invented the filet of fish sandwich and Ray Kroc, you know, at McDonald's. Turns out, so filet of fish sandwich was invented because a Cleveland uh, franchise owner found that on Friday nobody came to his store, right? All Catholics, they didn't want a burger. They wanted a fish sandwich. So he thought, oh my god, I'm going to make a fish sandwich, and I am going to make a freaking killing. So and this, you know, I imagine this conversation. He goes to Ray Kroc. He says, Ray, I got a sandwich. I got a sandwich to sell you. So what's a sandwich? It's a fish sandwich. A fish sandwich? I was, it's a fish I'm telling you, it's delicious. Well, what's a fish made out of? Halibut. Halibut? How much you want for that sandwich? I want 59 cents for that sandwich. 59 cents? I can't sell a sandwich for 59 cents. I want a 25 cent sandwich. And that's, in fact, what happened. He initially started with halibut, but it was too expensive because halibut was already in decline in, in the Atlantic. So he did cod. And when you sell cod at 25 cents a sandwich, you're going to have some cod problems eventually. So it wasn't just McDonald's. It was the entire sort of fast food industry and you know, frozen food industry that relied on these huge catches of cod off of the Canadian Grand Banks and the Georges Bank of um, uh, Massachusetts and also the European stocks of cod. Um, and those fish really hit, get hit hard. Um, if you look at the decline of North American cod, the only other vertebrate that shows a similar decline is the buffalo. Um, huge, huge, huge losses. So the filet fish sandwich, meanwhile, moves on. Um, in 94, campaigns get started against um, uh, Unilever and a lot of the big fish producing um, seafood companies. And McDonald's starts to realize, eh, I don't think we should make this cod sandwich anymore. So they start sourcing to another place. Anybody want to guess what the uh, uh, filet fish sandwich is today? It's a fish that probably you have never known you've eaten, but you've eaten it many times. It's the Alaska Pollock. Um, if you've ever had a California roll, uh, or um, any kind of um, fried fish product, chances are it was Pollock. Huge, huge resource, 60 billion pounds of Alaska Pollock off of Alaska. We take about between two and three billion pounds a year uh, and turn it into various fish products. Um, and you know, supposedly it's, it's, it's certified by the Marine Stewardship Council as being sustainable. But you know, you have to ask yourself, you take two billion pounds out of any ecosystem. Is there any ecosystem that, contain, that can sustain the removal of two billion pounds a year? I always wonder, who ate that two billion pounds before we took it? My sort of closet theory is that I think what ate a lot of the fish that 
we now eat is marine mammals. I think there were probably many, many more marine mammals before humanity developed its huge appetite for fish. So finally, um, uh, where we are now, though, is that another fish is coming on board. I was in a Denny's the other day, and this was the only fish on the menu. Uh, it's a farm fish that's come into this, you know, into this market. Can anyone guess the farm fish that's taking the place of cod? Tilapia. Yeah, I was, so I was in, when I was doing that cod story in Norway, um, I was talking with this cod farmer, and he was very excited about his product, and he had all these uh, spin-off ideas. He was going to make cod, cod skin bathing suits and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I was, I was like, great, great. And I was like, do you see any competition on the horizon, any problems? And his this sort of Nordic face you know, falls, and it's the middle of winter already, right? So it's very gray, and he goes, tilapia. He was, he, was, he was you know, very upset by tilapia, and I think he's since gone out of business. Um, tilapia is this crazy fish that um, it was actually one of the uh, ways it got to this country uh, was through the Peace Corps. Um, because you throw tilapia into a body of fresh water with a lot of algae in it, and they will basically eat, eat the algae and turn it into protein. Um, so algae, or sorry, um, tilapia have come to this country in force. Um, they're tremendously productive. Uh, you can feed them without feeding, you can grow them without feeding them any fish meal. Uh, but the other problem is that they're very, very, very invasive. They can tolerate a huge range of conditions. So while the tilapia market is becoming huge around the world, um, they themselves represent a problem of potentially displacing a lot of native fish, particularly in southerly ranges. So anyway, so that's the cod. Um, and we're down to the last fish. I, was, I, you know, I, I remember when I was in college when ever, ever, anyone ever said they were going to do a lecture about four things. When they were finished with the third thing, I was like, ah, oh, finally we're in the fourth thing. And the good thing is the fourth thing will be very short. Um, but it, it's, it takes up an equal part of the book, um, but it's tuna. Um, so, you know, if salmon represented the first loss of humanity, the inshore, the fish that really, I, I, I like to call salmon the Chinese food delivery of the fish world. They swam up into our rivers, they were right there in our environment, but we killed our rivers off and we're losing them river by river, so we've done with salmon except for Alaska and small parts of the Pacific Northwest. Um, the next step out was fish like sea bass, sea bass, snappers, nearshore fish, um, that once upon a time probably could sustain a lot of coastal humanity. But again, our numbers are too many. Our impacts upon the sea are too great. Uh, we don't have those coastal fish in the numbers we need to sustain um, the human food demand. Then we moved further offshore. We moved to cod. Cod, which oper you know, hang out on the continental shelves, still further offshore. We're starting to get through those fish. And now, you know, as I think I said in a New York Times article, we've moved out of the age of cod and we've moved into the age of tuna. And I think the rise of sushi it's not coincidental. It, it, the reason that sushi has become this international global commodity is that boats have gone further and further offshore to try and find some source of fish, and the cuisine has followed the, the particular culinary type. So, you know, tuna cross the oceans. As I said before, they're warm blooded, they swim at 40 miles an hour. And for me, tuna, um, you know, uh, represent sort of the next place I think we need to go with fish, which is that we need to somehow figure out a way of holding them in our heads as, as, as wildlife. You know, fish are not just food, they're not just game, they are the last wild food that we have, and they are wildlife in and of themselves. And as I said at the beginning of my talk, you know, I'm a fisherman, I've always loved to fish, it was always a way that I felt connected with nature. Uh, I never felt too much remorse about killing a fish because I always ate it. Um, but with tuna, it really, that was the thing that kind of pushed me over the edge um, and made me think that maybe I needed to rethink the way that I treated fish on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, so I thought I'd, read, I'd end with just a little reading from the book itself. So when I was, um, just after September 11th, 2001, I was actually in New York when the planes hit. And um, I had, previous to the attack, had um, booked a tuna trip. And I stayed in my apartment for about a week or so after the attack. And then I thought, well, you know, I have this tuna booking, I should go. So death and destruction was very much on my mind. I went out to Brooklyn and kind of amazingly, you can go out of Brooklyn on a, on a party fishing boat, pay a fare. Within a few hours, you can be on the fishing grounds and catch a tuna as big as I am. You know, it's kind of amazing, right? You know, you can't go out and hunt a tiger, you know, or, 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 you know, or a cougar. You know, within the range of New York City, you can find a fish as big as I am and you can catch it and you can kill it and you can eat it. Um, so I went out yellowfin tuna fishing, and I was fishing next to a guy named Steve uh, who had just walked out of Tower 2, and after that his wife told him that he could go fishing whenever he wanted. Um, so I'll just pick up here right when um, the first tuna of the night is on my line. I'm out on this boat called the Explorer, and we're out in the Hudson Canyon. The Hudson River actually extends past, um, way past shore, and um, uh, continues to kind of dig deep, and it makes this trench 
uh, that's you know 800 to 1500 feet deep, and it's a uh, funnel for bait fish, and it brings in a lot of blue water game like like tuna. So anyway, so I'm out there on the Hudson Canyon. It's very rough, um, very turbulent night, and it's just near September 11th. So I'll pick up there. Like the explorer, tuna are all engine. On the line, they feel like no other fish. And one can almost imagine the Schwarzenegger-type muscles flexing and pulsing their myoglobin-rich tissue in coordinated, punishing synchronization. They are the one fish out there that makes a fisherman think, I don't know if I can do this. As the tuna sprinted off, I sank into a kind of squat, trying to shift the stress from my back onto my knees. This, in turn, caused a problem. I'd worn extra wide pants to accommodate long underwear, but the weather was downright balmy out on the Hudson Canyon, and I'd shed my long underwear before coming to the rails. Now, as the tuna surged forward, I bent my knees in a defensive crouch, and my baggy pants fell down to my knees. When I reached around to try and pull them back up, the tuna team seemed to sense it and swam even harder. My pants finally settled midway down my thighs. Steve came up behind me. You don't look so good, he said. I know. You want me to take that pole for you? No, I'm fine. I said, hey, you don't have to feel ashamed. You said tuna are tough. I know. 10 minutes into the fight, the tuna stopped swimming, and I stopped reeling. Steve stood by my side and shook his head. Jesus, he said. Then all at once, it turned and charged the boat. Hey, real, buddy, real, 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 Steve shouted. I put my head down and cranked, trying to take up the slack. Hey, Jesus, buddy, watch out, I heard Steve cry. I opened my eyes and saw that the hood strings of my sweatshirt were dangling in my reel. I was about to be bound Ahab-like to my fishing pole. Gingerly, Steve reached around my shoulders and tucked the sweatshirt strings into my collar. Thanks, man, I said. Doing good, buddy. The tuna began swimming a broad, slow arc around the boat. It's the death spiral, Steve said solemnly. The death spiral diameter decreased with each big circle. Three more circles, and I dared to peek over the rail. Way down, just beyond the glow of the boat's running lights, I saw a muted green flash. Hey, Steve called out. We got color here. A mate came by and looked into the water. All that's greening over that little thing, he said. The mate lowered the gaff. I held my breath. Sometimes when tuna see the shining metal hook coming at them, they streak off in a ridiculous last ditch escape run, sometimes tail walking across the water before busting the line. But the mate dipped down agilely and struck into the fish's flesh. He tried to lift it into the boat. Jesus, he said. Not so little, I asked. Not so little. The mate was yanked into his tiptoes by the unseen force below. Steve thought fast and grabbed, grabbed another gaff and struck. He and the mate swayed back and forth like a pair of girls doing the hula. Then they each exhaled, counted to three, and raised their gaffs hand over fist and sink. The fish rolled over the, over the rail, furious. Steve shook his fr gaff free and jumped back. The tuna hit the deck hard. It was a yellowfin tuna. And true to its name, its dozen odd finlets running down the aft ridges of its torso glowed canary bright in the darkness. In spite of its hard fight, the fish was still angry and dangerous and as big as an adolescent. Its huge superheated eye met mine, and we both gasped for air. If the tuna had had a voice and the power of reason, it would have screamed and pleaded at this point. All a tuna ever does its whole life, it's crank its tail back and forth with great determination. Even after it's caught, after it's in there, it never occurs to a tuna to switch off its relentless tutor, tuna motor. Bap, 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 bap. It goes until the mate cuts its throat and the blood pours out onto the deck. Bap, 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 bap. Uh, uh. The engine runs down and then stops cold. Congrats, said Steve. Thanks, I said, and vomited. So that's that. Thank you very much. So um, I think, what time is it? Um, I think we have a time for a question or two. Um, any, and, uh, but if you don't want to ask questions now, we can also do it online. Anybody have a question? Uh, yeah, it's right over there. In the center? Yeah. How many good websites go to learn more about Pebble Beach and uh, about Pebble Mine? And yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So with Pebble Mine, um, there are, I, I, I've been you know, kind of teaming up with Trout Unlimited. And um, they have a couple of petitions on, online where you can write into congressmen and so forth. Um, the big decision that's coming up with Pebble Mine is going to be in October. Fortunately, the EPA agreed to hear the Pebble case, and they're going to be doing an evaluation. It's going to all come back to the point of whether or not they feel that the slag and the, and the cyanide-laced waters that will be generated from the mine can be stored in perpetuity, which is the EPA Clean Water Act um, requirement. So if you're going to get active, now is the time, uh, because it's really going to be before EPA in the next uh, few months. So, Anybody else? 
Well, I had a question. In, yeah. in your research for the book, um, what other species of fish did you run across that are also at, at this crossroads, like you mentioned, for the core four? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the American striped bass um, is an interesting case. Um, if you're from the East Coast and you fish, you know, the American striped bass is considered like one of the premier game fish. Um, and we actually had a huge, huge striped bass collapse in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but since then, they've implemented a really good management plan, and the striped bass have come back. We, we've been having some poaching issues lately, but generally, it's a remarkable recovery. Um, but one of the untold stories about the recovery of striped bass is that 60% of striped bass that are now sold are farmed. Now, it's a very different thing than the wild, uh, than the salmon model, because farm striped bass are actually farmed in ponds. Um, outside of the natural environment. You know, there, I tend to think that there are actually are ways of doing aquaculture that don't harm the environment. And one of them is by either, you know, is cr creating a clear barrier between farmed and wild. Um, you don't want to farm fish in an environment where they're going to bump into their wild cousins. Um, so yeah, so 60% of striped bass are now farmed. Um, they're pretty low on fish meal uh, use. And um, generally, I, I tend to believe in that as a, as, as a, as a good solution that was sort of fought out. So. Um, I, I think we're heading into the workday here. So I will say this. If you guys want to um, stay in touch, uh, my website is fourfish.org. Uh, there's a link to Facebook and to Twitter. My Twitter ID is four fish green, number four fish Greenberg. So if you have questions in the weeks and months ahead, um, I usually check it once or twice a month, or once or twice a week, rather. Um, and I'm happy to answer your questions and direct you. To, you know, I have a lot more resources on hand on the computer that I can direct you to different websites and so forth about the Pebble thing as it develops. And I will be actually going to Bristol Bay this summer, and I'll be tweeting about it. So if you want to kind of track along with that, I will, I will try and keep you all updated. So anyway, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time.